Mexico. I don't know if you guys were down there or not when that was happening. But, uh, but in general, the Atlantic is uh, a troubled sea. Another little piece of drop of water runs down the other direction and comes into the Pacific Ocean, right? Pacific. What does that word mean? It, uh, a related word is pacify, right? A peaceful, a peaceful sea. And uh, it all depends on where that little drop of water is, which, which direction it goes. So, <clears throat> today I want to talk about the great divide of Christendom. The gospel is forward-looking. The Bible says, remember Lot's wife. How come, why would it say, remember Lot's wife? Because she looked back, right? The gospel is forward-looking. God's primary concern now is not the old creation that has been decimated by the devil uh, so badly, but rather the new cre creation wherein dwells righteousness. I'd like to have us turn to Revelation chapter 21. This is uh, what we're all looking forward to. Revelation chapter 21, and I want to read verses 1 and 2 and 7. Revelation chapter 21, 1, 2, and 7. It says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And verse 7, He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. What comforting words. That's forward-looking, isn't it? That's where, we're looking to, that's where we're looking toward. There is a question which we must decide, and that is, which creation do we want to belong to? That's the new creation. There's no doubt about which of these two realms is now, in fact, ours by faith. By faith, we can be a part of the new creation, even now. We can sit with God in heavenly places today uh, as we give ourselves wholly to him. And then our scripture reading, we just heard that. Jesus has uh, got some big, some big uh, um, expectations for us. If I follow Jesus as my Savior and Lord, God will create in me a new me, along with that new creation. If I just choose to be a part of the new creation, he'll create a new me. God is going to create a, a new world, and he wants to put only newborn believers in that new world. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, I'm sorry, it's not 7, it's 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, there's an interesting verse. I think most of you can quote this by heart, but I just want to read it because it has to do with creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And here's what it says. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? A new, crea a new creature. One translation says a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. New creation. New creations in a new creation. He won't put old wine in new bottles. And he won't put new wine in old bottles, right? Our first birth is in the flesh. John 3 says that whatsoever is born of the flesh is what? Flesh. Paul uses that expression, flesh, to describe the sinful nature, the sinful me. The promise in John 3 to Nicodemus is that we can be born again into the new creation in Christ Jesus. Does that sound good to you or not? We can choose the creation we want to belong to, even though we were born in a sinful world. It doesn't matter how well educated, how cultured I am, or, seek, or even seek to be. Flesh is still flesh. It could be educated flesh. It could be cult cultured flesh. It may even be worse than that. Whatsoever is flesh is flesh, 
no matter where we are in the stage of life. Our fitness for God's kingdom is determined by the creation to which I belong. The one we choose, the old one or the new one, I want to pursue that idea today with you. Joshua told his people, choose you this day whom you will serve. And God has given us that most gracious opportunity again uh, many, many years later. The question we need to ask is if we've truly been born again. I heard somebody say that in a prayer meeting this morning. A question we need to ask ourselves, have we truly been born again of the Spirit? Or are we in re remaining in the flesh? Do you know when Paul talks about this, he's talking to Christians. Are you born again? He's talking to the congregation. We should take, not take this lightly. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Let's look at it together. Galatians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I think it's 15 and 16. Maybe it's 16 and 17. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Do you have it? If you have it, say amen. amen. It says, <clears throat> verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit... And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. And then verse 18 says, If ye be led by the spirit, you are not under the law. You are not under condemnation of law anymore. So... <clears throat> To walk in the Spirit is the evidence that we've been born again. Once we understand what God is seeking, namely, something altogether new for himself, this is a complete living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1 says, offer yourselves a living sacrifice. And how will that look if we have done that? Let's turn to Revelation 12. I just quoted verse 1, part of that verse. But let's turn to Romans chapter 12 now, verses 9 to 14. How will that look? Romans 12, verses 9 to 14. Here's what it says. Let love be without dissimulation or hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil. Cling to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in order preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in the spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. How many of us have patience? Really, the kind of does something sometimes come flying out of your mouth that you wish it hadn't happened? It kind of surprises us sometimes what's in there, right? Continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them that persecute you. Bless, that, bless them that persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be the same mind toward one another. Mind not high things but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your conceits. Wow, we could go on here and read further. It's wonderful. That's how it'll look. That's what new looks like. That's what a living sacrifice looks like. Jesus talked about this, and we already talked about it a little bit, but let's look at it. It's Matthew chapter 9, verses 16 and 17. Matthew chapter 9, verses 16 and 17. No man puts a piece of new cloth to an old garment. For that which is put 
in to fill it up takes, takes from the garment, and the rent is made worse. An old, an old piece of cloth on a new garment, or vice versa. Either one or, one or the other is going to be destroyed by it. Do not, do not, um, neither do men put new wine in old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runs out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine in new bottles, and both are preserved. You know, God has an eternal purpose for us, but he could not bring us to that purpose as we were. So the first thing he did was to do away with the old me on the cross. That's a good place to start, don't you think so? Let's read it from the Word. That's what the Bible says. Romans chapter 6, verse 6. The first thing he did was to make a new me in himself. This is a faith journey. We, we sometimes think it can't be unless we can hold it in our hands and we can look at it and, and, and handle it. But notice what he did here in verse 6. Romans 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man, what is that? That's the flesh, right? The old me. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. What is the tense in this verse? It's present, right? Present when Paul wrote it. Okay. Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It was just as true in 2,000 years before Christ as it is 2,000 years later, right? This is what he did, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. So when you read a text like that, what do we consider God did as he hangs on the cross? He took the old me and took it to the cross with him, right? It's the principle we're talking about here. It's a faith thing. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that, here, that hereafter we should not serve sin. A little farther down in verse 14 it says, sin shall not have dominion over you. That's important to know that, don't you think so? That's what Jesus did. The flesh was crucified with Christ for 60 centuries of earth people. That's why you can go to your neighbor and say, here's the gospel, here's the good news. John 3.16 says, whosoever believeth, everybody on your block is a whosoever. We're all whosoevers, right? Whosoever believeth in him should not perish. This happened before we were born. He's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So the old me has already been crucified with Christ. It's a decision that we make now, right? Will we accept such a gracious provision as all of that? When I say gracious, we're talking about grace, Jim, right? Full provision has already been made for everyone. And I guess it would be hard to believe that. Could you believe that? And having done that complete work in himself on the cross for us, Jesus comes out of the grave providing a new life for us as he has risen from the dead. That's the gospel. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. This is a powerful passage. This is good news for the Colossians. You know, in this book, of, in this letter to the Colossians, he says, read it also to the, to the Laodiceans. Laodicea was only about six miles away. He said, now read this to the Laodiceans. So who is it really written to? Us too. Okay. Colossians 3. If you then be risen with Christ, when did Christ rise? When he came out of the grave, right? If you be risen with him, if you died with him, it's a possibility you could rise with him, right? But that's a decision that we make. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your fixed affection on things above, not on the things of the earth. For you are what? <laughs> What's the tense here? 
If I'm crucified, with, if he took to the, to the cross my old me, then guess what? You are dead. I want to stress this in a little bit, in a little bit. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. So where's your life this morning? You know where your death is, right? It's in Christ. He did that 2,000 years ago. He died on a cruel cross. And the old me went with him. If I'll only give my heart to him and accept such a gracious gift. The cross is the grand divide, the great divide. The cross is the great divide for us believers, the new or the old, and we can choose which one. The choice is ours, the choice we make every day. Paul said, I die what? Daily. And that was in response to what Jesus did when he wrote that. Uh, that happened 30 years before he wrote this. He was crucified with Christ. Paul said, I die daily. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You know, I believe that the greatest negative in the universe for all time, the greatest negative in the universe for all time, throughout the ages of eternity, we'll be looking at this. The greatest negative in the universe is the cross. And I say that reverently. It was an instrument of human torture by the Roman government in the time of Christ. And Jesus took it, willingly giving himself to shame and contempt. That's a negative. What they did to the creator God, the one who inhabits eternity, the one who created all things, the galaxies. Anybody know how many galaxies that we know about right now? You know, we're talking, in, this, in, in the United States now, we're talking about trillions, right? <laughs> you ever hear the word trillion? <laughs> our government is in debt about 30 trillion. We look at that and it boggles our mind. There are over 2 trillion galaxies, each with billions of stars in the known universe. This is the creator, Jesus. He took it, willingly giving himself to shame. And with it, God wiped away everything that is not of himself. He wiped it away, everything that is not of himself, because there was a great controversy in the universe. The greatest positive in all, in, in all time is the resurrection. There's an empty tomb over in Palestine. There, it is the resurrection that stands at the threshold of the new creation. And the cross is the great divide between the two. Colossians 2, 14 and 15, it says that he took it and nailed it to the cross. Everything that's negative, everything that was against us, he nailed to the cross. The cross is the principle that ends all that belongs to the regime of Satan, a defeated foe, everything that is against us. It's God's new starting point. The cross is God's declaration that all in the old creation must pass away forever. And the Bible makes the case for us in the strongest possible language. This brings us to the subject of baptism. And that's really what I want to talk about this morning. You know, we can renew our baptismal vows this morning. And we need to think about that a lot. Let's turn to that baptism chapter. Anybody know what it is? The great baptism chapter is Romans chapter 6, okay? Romans chapter 6. Bury yourself in the book of Romans. This is, this is wonderful. Romans chapter 6. And let's read verses uh, 3 and 4. Know you not that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Now, when did Jesus die? 2,000 years ago, right? 31 A.D. It's not quite 2,000 years ago when he died on the cross. 
Therefore, we are, what is the tense here? Paul does this again and again in his letters. What is the tense? We are, what? Buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. How much closer could creator God come to us than taking us with him into the grave, destroying the old me and everything that's against him, and coming up with a new life that he offers us freely. We must ask ourselves, what is the significance of these words? Baptized in the Bible is so strongly associated with salvation. Uh, let's turn over a few pages to the left. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. This is not just about something we read when we have a baptism here. This is something that's a principle that should be in our minds quite often. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. It says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Wow, salvation issue. And 1 Peter 3, 18 to 20. Let's turn to that one. 1 Peter chapter 3, 18 to 20. Just a little bit before Revelation. 1 Peter chapter 3, 18 to 20. For Christ also has once suffered for sins. How, how long did he suffer? Once. For sins. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. By which also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. We could, we could talk about this for an hour, but I'm not going to go into that one, okay? Which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, with wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by, were saved by water. The like figure, whereunto even baptism does also now save us, not putting away the filth of the flesh, but answer to a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Resurrection. There's a lot in there. But notice this. Enter in the ark. Noah and the seven souls that were with him stepped by faith out of the old world into the new world. They stepped out of the corrupt world into a new world. They were out of the old corrupt system and now they were on the ark. Safe and secure. Genesis 6, 5, and 6 is a snap snapshot of the old world. It says the imaginations of men were only evil how often? Continually. Always. That's the old world. And they were safe and secure now in the new world. Notice verse 21 again here. The like figure whereunto even baptism does also now save us, not putting away the filth of the flesh, but answering of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That um, ark floating upon the water is the type of the baptism that we can have with Jesus every day. In baptism, we confirm that we are joined to Christ, even in Christ. In Christ is the ark. That's where we need to be every day. Just as surely as Noah was in the ark, safe from the elements of sin, notice a verse from the baptism chapter, Romans 6, verse 14, it says, sin shall not have dominion over you. What does that mean? Sin shall not have dominion over you. It means you're not going to be a slave to that now anymore, right? Are there some things in our lives that we're slaves to? We don't have to be that way. God wants us to be free from all known sin. Known sin. To do otherwise is rebellion. High-handed rebellion against him. We don't want to do that, do we? 
Notice a verse from the baptism chapter again. Sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but what? Under grace. Under grace. You're not under condemnation anymore. There's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. In baptism, we put on Christ. Galatians 3.27. Acts 16.31-33 to talks about the Philippian jailer and his family. He said, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. How many? You and your whole family. And they were baptized. And they rejoiced greatly, having believed in God. And that's the cardinal experience of the new world. Rejoicing. <laughs> First Thessalonians 5, verse 16 says, it's a very short verse, rejoice evermore. Rejoice evermore. And 1 Peter 3, 21 says that the answer of baptism is a good conscience toward God. That's what repentance is. It is a soft heart toward God. It is sorry for what we have done to him. All of us had a part in Calvary. In view of all of this, what then is my answer to God's verdict of the old creation? The old creation died. If I so choose, I answer by asking, by asking for baptism. So I want to ask you this morning, what are the qualifications for baptism? Who qualifies for this burial called baptism? And this is for all of us, whether we've been baptized or not. What qualifies us? The answer is only the dead are baptized. We only, bring, we only bury what kind of people? Dead people. There's some been instances where that hasn't been true. And they start hearing the knocking on the side of the casket. So if I ask to be baptized, I proclaim that I am dead and fit only for the grave. I am buried with him by baptism into death. So uh, Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Can we identify with that in 2022? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Baptism is an indicator, a marker, that I believe, Romans 6, 6, that my old nature is crucified with him, is crucified with him that the old me is crucified with Christ. Some have thought that baptism is a means of dying. What's wrong with that picture? Is baptism a means of dying? <laughs> we don't want to be buried, buried alive, do we? We don't get buried and then die. We bury dead people. In this connection, I am crucified with, I am crucified with Christ. The old man died. With Jesus, many years ago, on a cruel cross. And when I realize all this, I sincerely and gladly accept his death on my behalf, and I die. It takes faith to believe that. He died. I accept that. I die. Death comes by allowing the Holy Spirit to give us the faith to believe all this. Romans 6.11 says... Reckon it. Believe it. I'd like to have a look at that. That's Romans chapter 6, verse 11. When, you, uh, when you're thinking about this, this verse says, believe it. Don't for a moment doubt that you are crucified with Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 11. It says, likewise, verse 11, all have it. Likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Reckon it. What does it mean?
I die how often? I die daily. Resurrection morning. All things became new for Jesus. Resurrection morning. He was delivered from the great load of the burden of sin. And whose sins were they? They're my sins. He was delivered from the load of sin on that resurrection morning. My sins and all the sins and all this was done for us. This is the science of salvation. That morning he left the old me behind in the tomb. As soon as I really recognize what happened that day, and I choose to be a part of all of this, all things become new for me too. And the Bible calls that the new birth, being born again. And the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts and reasons with us. He says, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be like wool. That's new. We're all sold down the river by disbelieving God's word. Our first parents disbelieved God's word. That's how we were sold down the river. But we were saved by what? Believing. believing. <laughs> we're saved by believing. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved in all your house, Acts chapter 16. What happened almost 2,000 years ago becomes a reality for me the moment that I believe. Jesus becomes my Savior and Lord. Christ is my righteousness. And this is the culmination of my personal search for the cross. We're all on a journey here. Are we all on a journey this morning? Yes. Yeah. Our journey is in a search for the cross. Someone might say, well, why waste your time on this? Let's get down to keeping the law. Okay. I've heard that argument a lot. Let me tell you, there will be no genuine legal performance or keeping the law in me until I know and purpose that Christ is my life. That comes first. Colossians 3, 1 to 4, we read a while ago, when I give myself to Jesus, the heart will be softened to him and I will rejoice in keeping the law. Faith brings a strong love for Jesus. And Jesus once said, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. This is a love thing. It's a faith thing and a love thing. It's the goal of faith and love. The cross is still the way home. Nothing important happens without it. Unless our eyes have been <clears throat> opened by God to see what to see that we have died with Christ and buried with him, nothing important will happen. There will be no real legal performance in our lives. And we're not ready for baptism. <laughs> but if we do see it, then there's a paved highway, even a freeway, to the baptismal fount. We can't wait to identify ourselves completely with him and be raised to newness of life. The cross is still the way home. Nothing important happens without it. Unless our eyes have been opened by God to see that we have died with Christ and been buried with him, we are not ready for baptism. It's all about the grace that is in Christ Jesus. But if we do see it, there's a paved highway to the baptismal fount. We can't wait till tomorrow. The reason we step down into the water is that we have recognized that in God's sight, we have accepted the cross, the principle of the cross. The Father says, I'm just kind of making some imagery here about what the Father says about all of this. Do you think he's on looking with all this without with just passiveness? You know, the Father's in, we're, we're all the children of the Father, right? He's interested in this and our relationship to it. The Father says, Christ died. I have included you in the death of my son. What is your answer to me? You know, the only thing the father will ever really ask is, what did you do with my son? You knew this. 
like Belshazzar. Daniel said to Belshazzar, you knew all of this, and yet we've come to this? What do you think Adventist preachers should be preaching in the pulpit today? We have a commission to take the gospel to the world. This is the very center of the gospel. What should my answer be? Lord, Lord, I believe. I say yes to the death burial that you have committed to me. And in baptism, I give public assent to the fact that I am crucified with Christ, that I have accepted your most gracious offer, and that I am included in all of this. That's the best news that any individual could ever hear. I'm trying to say this as many ways as I can this morning. Some things have been repeated too much, maybe. I don't want to belabor this too far, but let me ask you. When are you comfortable with burying your loved ones? Indeed, only when they're absolutely, you're absolutely sure they're dead. So will I ask to be baptized when I see that God's way is perfect and flawless? I'll be asked to be, I'll, I will ask to be baptized when I see in my mind that God's way is perfect and flawless. Number two, when we really realize that I deserve to die. Anybody here feel that way? <laughs> you know, that's a prerequisite from baptism. If I don't see that I deserve to die, then I'm not ready for baptism, right? And thirdly, when I truly believe in the gospel provision of my old man dying with Jesus on the cross, everything hangs on these three precepts. And then I can say, praise the Lord, I'm dead. Now get me buried. Can you see that this is all a faith thing? We're saved by faith. And uh, not about how I feel about things. The old man is so bad that God doesn't just want to patch it up. He wants it to be dead so he can raise me to newness of life. Jesus put it plainly before us. He said, if any man will follow after me, let him take up his what? Cross and follow me. Where did Jesus' cross lead him? It led him to a little hill, right, where he died. And that's the same place that will lead us. The apostles taught this in the first century. They pointed again and again to a new world experience. There's an old world out there, and there is a new world. And between them is the cross, which is the great divide between the two. So baptism is no small thing. It is a conscious break from the old life. If you would want to continue in the old life world, why would you even want to be baptized? Now, when I'm dead and buried, what is this new life like? Let's look at a text in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. You know, in baptism... God has made a provision for us to be absolutely, um, what's the word I'm trying to search for? Absolutely united with him, that's not the word. Um, we, are, we are on the same page. Galatians 3, verse 27. It says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have done what? Put on Christ. Put on Christ. Um, <clears throat> to be in Christ is to put on Christ. Jesus once said, If seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Putting on Christ means to be united with him. The word I was looking for a while ago is that he identifies with us that closely. We are crucified with him, buried with him, come up out of the grave with him. If ye then be risen with him, he says. It means to have the Holy Spirit with his beautiful fruits of the gospel. We are united in death with him. Then we are united in new life with him. And if I've been baptized before 
and never understood all of this, the joy of salvation. You know, I was baptized when I was 10 years old. Nobody ever told me this. I had no idea about this. I just knew a few, um, few things. <laughs> I don't know, I see some recognition on some faces. You can identify with this, can't you? The question is, should I be baptized again? Romans 6, verse 5. Romans 6, verse 5. Romans 6, verse 5. I'd like to first to see this one. For if we have been, what is the next word? Planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now that word planted is an interesting word. If we are united with him in death, we are united in a new life with him. If I've been baptized before and never understood all these things, should I be baptized again? That's the question. Planted together with him takes on the color of being grafted in. In fact, one version says grafted in with him. Not only planted, but grafted in. And what is the value of grafting? Grafting is a science. It doesn't always work unless you know how to do it. There was a, an orchardist in Idaho that I knew. Uh, maybe, Craig, you remember a name when you were in Idaho by the name of Garfield Schultz. Do you remember that man? don't remember that name. Okay. He's been dead number, several years now, but he was an orchardist. He was very good at grafting certain things into another tree. It would, if it was a stone fruit, it could be a cherry or an apricot. He, he was successful in this. And he knew how to do that. And orchardist leaves maybe a few lower branches on the old stock so that you can taste and see the difference. The lower branches bear fruit, but it's not saleable. They're little tiny apples and, uh, you know, and they're bitter. <laughs> how many like to bite, bite into a piece of bitter fruit that doesn't taste good? It leaves a bitter taste in your mouth. But, but the graft in branches bore luscious and flavorful fruit. He said, I left some of the lower branches to show the difference so that we can see the value of grafting. We need to be grafted into the original stock. How can one tree bear, fruit, bear the fruit of another? How can a poor tree bear good fruit? Only by grafting, or as Paul said, planted together with Christ. The authorized version actually uses the word grafted. So uh, I'm way ahead of my notes here. I've kind of lost my place. It's time to quit. So <clears throat> an earthly surgeon can take a piece of skin from one place and graft it into another. Uh, cannot the divine surgeon implant the life of his son into, an, into, into a new me? There's only one really fruitful life in this whole world, and that has been grafted in, and that is those who have been grafted into Jesus. The new birth is the reception of that life that I never had before. It's not an improvement on the old one, but a new life altogether. The old is so inscrutably bad that it has to be destroyed. And he starts over. So God has cut the old life away by the death of his son, and grafted the new life in by the resurrection of his son. And, uh, you know, you might say, well, that was first century teaching, the resurrection, first century teaching. The disciples ran all over the world talking about the resurrection. That was present truth in the first century. But I've got to tell you, it's, first, it's present truth in this century too. In these years just before Jesus comes, that has a lot to do with me. And here it is in our preparation for the second coming. It's the everlasting gospel in the framework of the judgment. 